coming up on this episode. So he says Mount Carmel is not just, you know, one peak. It's a range. That's how they did this. And then he says, remember when we went by Mount Tabor? And I said, oh yes, after Na uh, Nazareth and we were driving down, we could see Mount Tabor. And it's in a flat plain, it's one peak sticking up. He says, see, sometimes it's one mountain and sometimes it's a range of mountains. You see, Mount Carmel is like Mount Gilboa. It consists of many peaks. Thus, I believe, following the same type of situation where we have Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, it's not one peak. It can be a small range. Hi, and welcome to Evidence for Faith. It's your host, Michael Lane. So glad you're joining us today as we finish part four of our series we're doing on evidence of the Exodus. And today we're going to be talking about Mount Sinai, which is also called Mount Horeb. So we're picking up from the last lesson. The last lesson I sort of left as a cliffhanger. They have crossed the Red Sea that after leaving Egypt. They've wandered a little bit into the, the desert area of what I believe is Saudi Arabia, the land of Midian, as the Bible called it. And um, even Paul in Galatians chapter 4 supports that. And now they're moving to the mountains. And as we've said before, there's so many different places in, in the Middle East that people claim is the actual Mount Sinai. And I mean, oh my gosh, there's so many of these. Some are in Egypt themselves. Many are in the Sinai Peninsula. There's even one in the Transjordan area. Um, and then this one in, uh, and there's a couple actually in Saudi Arabia. But we're going to be looking at, at one in particular one because we're going to follow the evidence of what we see with the scripture. And what is this so interesting is they, they do align and go together. So it really gives us a really clear picture. I believe that this is the place where Moses received the Ten Commandments, also where God came down to meet with the people. So they've just come out of this. And the reason a lot of times our Bibles, particularly the atlas in your Bible, if you have an atlas in the back of your Bible, many times they'll have the, the trek of the Exodus and they follow it down into the bottom, the apex of the Sinai Peninsula. And I don't think that's the right place. But they do this because um, it's following an old tradi uh, tradition, a very old tradition. And that's where they get into this thing. Um, I believe that route is totally wrong. And there's down there in the Sinai Peninsula, people will flock there by the thousands every year to go to St. Catherine's Monastery. And um, they say that right there is where Mount Sinai was. But it doesn't fit all of the biblical parts of the story. So I disagree with that. Um, I think, and I also agree that uh, and think that the Gulf of Aqaba was the Red Sea because of the evidence again and, and the, ge the geography of what is mentioned about the story itself so fits this. So um, that's where we sort of left them. We last left the Israelites crossing the Gulf of Aqaba. They proceeded into the land of Midian. And let's pick it up. Starting with Exodus chapter 17, we read, All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of Sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Rephidim is a scrubby desert place, as you can see from the illustrations that we're giving you here. It's a flat, desolate plain surrounded by mountains all around, just a large, flat, desolate place. Very large, remember this is a large group of people who have moved here now, these Israelites. Um, there's no shade, but what is really important, there is no water. So notice the mountains in the background. I want you to notice this. Notice how the tops of them, of some of them, are darkened. Yeah, they have darkened tops. Um, this is not the results of clouds. So if you'll notice in the skyline around, there is no clouds whatsoever. It's a clear blue sky that they have. So the shadow that you're seeing here is not from clouds or some other type of shadow. Something else very remarkable um, and very important to this story will explain the cover of those top of the mountains. Um, now first, we must deal with the lack of water because that's where we, we start with chapter 17. The people have a lack of water and that's a lot of people. So the people start to what? 
complain. They complain to God. They complain to Moses again. Um, and so Moses goes to God and asks, okay, what are we supposed to do? Move down to verse 6. We read this. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a really interesting verse. Um, I want to draw your attention precisely to what God told Moses to do in this rocky area. He tells him to go and stand at a rock. So he actually it reads, Behold, I will stand be before you there, on the rock at Horeb. Now, think about this. The whole area. You're on top of a mountain here. It's a granite mountain. Everything here is rocks. There's rocks all over the place. And they're told that um, God tells Moses, I'm going to stand before you at this rock. So over here on the mountain, go stand by the rock. I, don't you find that interesting? I almost find it humorous in a way. What this means is there has to be something very special about one of the rocks on top of Mount Horeb. Let me put it to you this way. Say, for instance, like where I used to live um, for the last 20-something uh, years up in the north woods of Wisconsin, deep, dense forests all around, red pines, white pines, balsams, poplars, birch trees. We had all sorts of stuff, trees everywhere, so thick. Matter of fact, where my house was, you could look out any window in my house and all you could see was trees. That's all it was because I lived deep in the forest. Now, just imagine for a minute, if you were going to come up and visit me when I lived at that house and I, and I said something like this to you, like you asked me, for instance, where do you want to meet? And I, was, and I say this, um, I'll meet you at the tree in the forest. Would that help much? I mean... The whole forest is there. There's trees everywhere. But if I tell you, go meet at the tree, well, meet at the tree in the forest, that means there's probably some type of special tree that stands out from the others. Now, with that mindset, that's the same thing God is sort of telling Moses. Go stand on the rock at Horeb. The whole mountain is a rock. So there has to be something very special there that stands out among all of the other type of rocks and, and everything else in this mountain range. And there is. Look at the photo you're seeing now. You see the size of this massive granite rock? This is in the Mount Sinai range. Now remember, we talked about this once before. Mountains, just this name of a mountain, in the Bible, is not necessarily one sole mountain peak. It can sometimes be a whole range. Mount Carmel, Mount Gilboa, they have different peaks, yet it's one range. So we have something like that occurring here. Uh, we have a whole range where Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, and, and this range is. And the Israelites are where? They're camped down at the foot in the flat plain at the bottom of these mountains. But there is this huge rock that you see jutting up several meters tall. And in this picture, you can actually see a few people in it, if you notice carefully. Look where the arrows are pointing. You'll see a few people standing there to give you the size of this rock. There's nothing else like this anywhere around. So, no doubt, this is probably what God, I mean, God didn't go up and write his name on it. This is the rock. Moses didn't write, this is the rock. But judging from what we read in the Bible and what we see all around here, this really fits like a hand in a glove. Now, with the people complaining of no water, Moses ascends up to this mountain, and God tells him what to do. And we read about this. Of all places, we get a good description of this in the book of Psalms. Yes, the book of Psalms. Chapter 78, verses 15 and 16, tells us what happens there in a really cool way. It reads... He splits rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rocks and caused the waters to flow down like rivers. What we have is Moses taking his rod, as God instructs him, he strikes the rock, the rock splits, and water comes out. That's what we have taking place here. 
Water flows. Yes, this is supernatural. You cannot explain this by any type of scientific means. It is just a miracle. Water comes flowing out of this rock. And I'm not talking just a little trinkle, just a small amount of water, like somebody turned on a faucet or something. Remember, you got thousands, hundreds of thousands of people down here at the bottom of this mountain, and they're and they got animals and stuff with them, so they're very, very thirsty. You're going to need more than just a faucet. The water would have to become shooting out of this so fast with such velocity and such power to run down the mountain so that the people could have water to drink. Because remember, these people have not had any water. They're all thirsty. Water was needed. It was needed quickly so that people could drink. And the force of that water coming out of the rock splits the rock and cuts through the rock. Um, and remember, this is granite. This is very hard igneous rock, and it splits this rock. And for the amount of water to come out to feed the people over time for, the, for a while here, for this to take, it's just not turning on and off. It's running for a long time. And for this to happen, and since it does not rain in this area very often, there should be some evidence of this. Well, I took the photo of this rock actually a couple of photos of the rock and the, um, the, the uh, land surface around it um, for several meters going down. And I showed this to a, a, a geologist friend of mine. Now, I did not tell him anything about this being from the Moses account, that this is Mount Sinai or anything. I just brought it up to this geologist friend of mine and I showed him pictures. I said, could you do me a favor? I just want your input on something. I laid these pictures down in front of him and I said, what can you tell me by looking at that rock, he was impressed with the rock. It's this thing, he'd never seen this before, and he's like, wow, this is really something. And he's looking and studying. Very quickly, he says, I gotta know what kind of rock this is. Do you know what type of rock it is? And I said, yes, that is actually granite. Um, that's just really beautiful granite, so it's very hard. And he goes, okay. And as he studied this, and he studied the pattern below going out from this rock, he says, um, and the roundedness of where the rock is split, it is rounded around. He looks at this all carefully and he says, well, there's no question about it. This is done by water erosion. And I said, oh, okay, that's what I thought. And he says, where is this? Do you know where this picture is taken from? I said, yeah, on top of a mountain in Saudi Arabia. And he was like, what? Yeah, then I told him what this was all about with the Exodus thing. He was absolutely speechless when he was looking at this and he just studied these pictures so much and he goes, this looks like water had to have formed this and ran down even showing water erosion going down. He says, this is definitely water. I find that amazing. It's a great piece of evidence. Well, back to our story. After spending some time at Rafidim, they moved a little bit closer to Mount Sinai because God wanted to speak to all the people there and not just through Moses as, as a mediator, as he has been doing. He, what he's doing, you see, God, God is planning on doing something really special. He's going to put on a show. God is dramatic. I mean, think about your Bible stories and stuff. He likes to make an entrance. He likes to, to do things and really impress. He's great at that. And he wanted to do this with the Israelite people. So what he does is he has them all come along there at the bottom because he's going to present... Um, himself at this mountain and speak directly, audibly to the people. It was a terrifying experience. If you read uh, Exodus 19 and 20, the people were just going crazy, yelling, please let God st stop talking to us. Moses, just let him speak to you and you speak to us. This is terrifying. But anyway, that's where, that's the plan God has. So in Exodus chapter 19, the first two verses, we read this. On the third moon, after the people of Israel had gone up out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of the Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came to the wilderness of Sinai. There they camped in the wilderness. There Israel camped before the mountain. So that gives us the position. They have moved over from Rephidim to the land right at the foot of the mountain now, and they're camped there. And um, we're, we're faced with, again, with this timeless question, where is Mount Sinai? Now, to answer that question, I think we have to examine uh, what others say. Uh, there, there are, like I say, there's a few examples of what I've read. And let me just pull out a couple of things here 
um, some dictionaries and things on where Mount Sinai is. Because I'll tell you, if, if you ask many people, you're going to get so many different opinions. Let's, let's look at some of these opinions. Out of the Harper's Bible Dictionary, this is what it says about Mount Sinai. Quote, as many as a dozen mountains in Sinai and northwestern Arabia have been identified with this sacred spot, but none of them have been accepted by all scholars, unquote. True. Here's uh, from the Anchor Yale Bible Dictionary. It reads, quote, in modern times, at least a dozen different sites have been proposed, including mountains in the north and west of the Sinai Peninsula, in southern Palestine, in Transjordan, and in Saudi Arabia, unquote. Isn't that wild? Uh, let's take a look at the Archaeological Encyclopedia of the Holy Land. What do they say? The identification of Mount Sinai is also doubtful. The early Christian tradition identifies it with Jebel Musa, which Mount of Moses, on which Justinian I dedicated a monastery to St. Catherine of Alexandria in the year 527. If this identification is correct, it would imply that the Israelites made a long, difficult, and topographically unnecessary detour in the rough southern part of the peninsula. So there's just three sources. And like I say, we could go on. There's so many different sources that are out there. And most of them say we just don't know. Well, it's what we've been doing. Let's take what the Bible says. We're exploring it and seeing how it compares with everything. Okay, before we go any further, let's re review something. As I said, some mountains named in the Bible are not a single mountain top, but they're a range of mountains. During one of my first trips to Israel, we were standing at a place called Megiddo, and I was looking to the west of Megiddo, and there's a large mountain range going across, a lot of peaks going along for a long way, all the way up basically to the Sea of uh, or the Mediterranean Sea. So I was standing there looking at this, and I asked my friend, Dr. Stephen Notley, if he could point out which one of the mountains was the one that, Mount, uh, that Elijah had his battle with the, the uh, prophets of Baal and Asherah on Mount Carmel. I said, which one of these is Mount Carmel? And I'll never forget what he did. He, he pointed his head to the mountain range, and he just swept his hand back, and he said, that's Mount Carmel. I said, I don't get it. He says, that is all Mount Carmel. I said, well, which one's the peak? He says, well, we don't know. We don't know which one it is. He says, there's a little monastery up on one of the tops over there. Um, we can go there and take a look at it. But he says, this, this is just all the mountain range is called Carmel. And then we, he says, look over here to, the, uh, to your right. And here's a mountain range going out this way. Not quite as impressive as that. And he says, do you know what that is? I said, well, this is where Mount Gilboa is, right? And he goes, yes. All of these tips here and everything, all of this range, about 10 miles of it, is um, Mount Gilboa. So he says, Mount Carmel is not just, you know, one peak. It's a range. That's how they did this. And then he says, remember when we went by Mount Tabor? And I said, oh, yes. After Na uh, Nazareth and we were driving down, we could see Mount Tabor. And it's in a flat plain. It's one peak sticking up. He says, see, sometimes it's one mountain, and sometimes it's a range of mountains. And I think that's what we basically have here. Thus, I believe, following the same type of situation, where we have Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, it's not one peak. It can be a small range. And I think that's what we have. I think Mount Sinai is actually a range of mountains in Arabia, and it consists of many peaks in the land of what would have been in those days the land of Midia. It consists of many peaks. Some peaks, if you notice in the picture here, are very, very dark and blackened near the top. And why is it like that? Well, we talked about it before and I said, we'll come to it. Here we go. Why in the photograph do you see the dark coloration? It's because of what you read in Exodus chapter 19, verses 18 through 20. In here, you come across where it says, Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The top of the mountain range here, God descends on. Later on, he allows the 70 elders to come up and see his feet standing on top of the mountain. But as God came down, for the first time, he comes down and stands on this mountain and 
it's in fire. So it appears that this mountain is on fire. I mean, this had to be an amazing sight. No one of these peoples, it says in Exodus 19, they were terrified by, by the vision and, and hearing what was going on. I think that's the reason the range is darkened. It's, it's unnatural, but scripture does give us an explanation. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, we read, And you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, while the mountain burned with fire to the heart of heaven, wrapped in darkness, cloud, and gloom. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. And scripture tells us it terrified the people. I bet it did. I bet it did. So Moses wrote that the mountain burned with fire. But think about this. We're on top of a mountain. It's very high. And with the pictures we're seeing around here of Mount Sinai, there's no vegetation. So what was burning? That's a good question. Because it's just granite rock. There's no vegetation. What was burning? I believe it's a supernatural burning. I believe this is a miracle again. You cannot explain it by anything. Um, looking again, we get another clue now. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 4 and 5, reads, The Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire, while I stood between the Lord and you at the time, to declare to you the word of the Lord. For you were afraid because of the fire. You did not go up into the mountain. I bet they were afraid. So what Moses is saying here, that he was between the fire on top and the people down below. Mo Moses was up some ways into the mountain and very close to the fire. God descended on this mountain in fire and in smoke. And he was, like I said, he was coming down to speak to the people. They've been breaking his laws and, and doing all sorts of things and complaining all the time. He's coming down now. What a sight this had to be. You would think, well, this is going to straighten these people out. Well, we're going to find out it doesn't. But um, he was not going to just speak to Moses, um, but to all the people. He wanted to speak to everybody. Before this, he's always going through Moses. Now he orally speaks to the people and gives them the laws. And it terrified the people. All the people witnessed this supernatural event. And Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, if you will, is likely this range that we're showing you here in a photograph that is very large, but it's got uh, darkened, darkened tops all through this area. I believe that's where it is. Now, I know a person who has led tours up there into this area. And if a person does ascend into this area, this mountainous area, more mystery will just unfold before you. Supernatural events you can't explain. Adding to the accuracy of the biblical account with this place. Because you can pick up rocks, and you'll see that the rocks are totally burnt on one side, but to, and just blackened. But if you turn them over, they're still pink, like ordinary granite. How does that happen? This is not a volcano with lava flowing through here. That does, no, that's not what the, this is going on here. That's not what's happening here. As one person, um, I was listening to him who went up, uh, two of, um, actually him and a buddy, went on this tour and went exploring, uh, hiking up into this area and came back and talked about it. And they said it was like God took a, a gigantic blowtorch to the top of the mountain and just melted and burnt the top of the rocks. Everything, whatever you turn over is burnt black, but when you turn it over, it's pink underneath. So it was the most amazing thing. But there's more to this area than just burnt rock. The Bible records other events happening here too that help to support this case that this area is Mount Sinai. So let's continue to examine what the Bible has to say about it and see how it stacks up to what we find. In Exodus chapter 24, verse 4, it reads, And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Okay, two things are being done there. Two things that are changing the, the layout of the land. Moses is building an altar and he's setting up these, these pillars. So if that happened, 
in this area, it's very likely, since this is not traveled much, and it's out in, in a desolate place, it's very likely some of the remains of the altar will still be there, that we could find this, and the pillars also. Well, if you go to Saudi Arabia and you travel around this area and you examine this, this spot here, you're going to find out at the base of the mountain is found an ancient man-made structure. There is. There's no question about it. It's man-made, as you can see from the image I'm showing you here. These lines and stuff could be the remains of the altar built by Moses and the Israelites. Now, some of you are looking at this photograph and you just see, you know, uh, straight lines of rocks being laid out and then there's an angle turn. Definitely it's man-made. But you're thinking, that's an altar? Altars are not always like what we see in a Sunday school book of just a bunch of rocks piled up um, in, a, in a small circle of like, you know, three or four feet across. Some altars in the Bible are huge, like what they saw in the temple. Herod's temple had a huge one. Uh, Solomon's temple had a huge one. Even the tabernacle had a good size altar. But let me tell you one that's really interesting. Um, God commanded Moses to tell Joshua that when they came into the promised land, that Joshua was to build an altar on Mount Ebal. Now, during the 1970s, a non-believing Jewish archaeologist, his name was Adam Zertal, he did not believe in the Bible, um, he went to Mount Ebal. There had been very little excavation done up there over the years, and he started digging there, and he found, uh, as he started digging into this area, a huge structure. At first, he didn't know what it was. He thought it was a house at first. Then he realized, no, it's got walls around it. Nope, this must be a fort. He didn't know what it was, but a friend of his um, took a look at his drawings and said, I can tell you what this is, because um, he was a Jew who um, goes to synagogue and, and uh, says, this looks just like a picture um, that I've seen in some books of an altar that, um, that the Jews built. And Adam Zertal then realized what he found was an altar, and not just an altar, the altar that Joshua built for the people under the commandment here of God to build this. It was lined with plaster on the outside, and it was written with the law written on in the plaster all around this huge, huge thing. As you see the photograph of this thing, it is huge. It's a gigantic, gi gigantic sized altar. So don't always think altars are small little things. This thing is big. And by the way, Adam Zertal found as he was doing this, a lot of the stones were had plaster on one side. That's very unusual too. But anyway, looking back at Mount Sinai, at the lines that we see here of the man-made stones laid out, is this actually part of an altar that Moses built? Could be. We don't have Moses' name here. Moses built this in the year, you know, 1446. We don't see that, but it fits the story. The evidence here of what we're seeing fits this account as described in Exodus 24. Now, besides the altar that Moses built on Mount Sinai, um, he was also commanded to build 12 pillars, 12 pillars uh, to set them up, one for each of the 12 tribes. So, if this is the place, the correct place, if we look around, we should be able to find possibly the remains of pillars. And look at this picture here. You can see these la large circular stones. They're huge stones. And the thing is, they look just like they've stacked up on top of each other. There's earthquakes often in this area. Um, it's been toppled, but these look like these were pillars that were set up. Man brought these things in. It's interesting, too, just to let you know, they're not made of granite. They're made of marble. Marble's not found around that area. So where did the marble come from? That's a good mystery. No one really knows. But they've been sitting there, obviously, for millennia. Are these the pillars that Moses was commanded to put up? It fits the story account, does it not? I mean, there's other events that take place here also at the base of this mountain where the people camped. Um, and when they approach the mountain, this is where we get the story of Aaron and the golden calf. Remember in Exodus, skip down to verse or chapter 32, verse 4. And he, that's Aaron, received the gold from the hands and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. There we are. A calf was made. 
Uh, Moses had gone up in the mountain. He hadn't come back. He's been gone for a long time, for weeks. And they're sort of like, well, we don't know what happened to this Moses guy. Aaron, build us a God to take us back to Egypt or something. Well, what ends up happening is Aaron builds this, this calf. And they start to celebrate it. And in Exodus 32, verse 5, we read, when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. So we have not only the golden calf, we also have an altar that was built so that this thing could sit on it. Amazingly, a structure that fits the description is found at the base of this mountain today. Today, it's totally fenced off, as you can see in the pictures here. It's protected. It's a fascinating place. You can see huge stones. Now, you can see these stones did not sit here because, uh, naturally because the plain around is totally flat, that these have been placed there and it's sort of flat on top. But what's really interesting is you, if you look closely, you'll see carvings of calves along this thing, calves and bulls. And there's other carvings too. But all around this thing are these carvings. So they've got a fence around this. This is protected. Um, could this be the altar that Aaron built? It has a flat top to it, a place where you could easily put the gold calf that he made. Is this the place? I mean, this fits the story. Well, you might be wondering what happened to the gold. Um, we'll come to that in a second. In Exodus chapter 32, verse 6, now I'm going to read this out of the God's Word translation. It makes it a little easier to understand. It reads, early the next day, the people sacrificed burnt offerings and brought fellowship offerings. Afterwards, they sat down to a feast, which turned into an orgy. Hey, it's right out of scripture. So what's going on? Aaron built this calf because of the peer pressure from the people. He put, uh, had them build an altar. He puts the calf on top of the altar. The people have a big feast, and then they just really let go. They go absolutely crazy. Of course, Moses and Joshua are not there. They're up on the mountain. Joshua, not quite as high as, as Moses. Moses was further up, but they were up there. Moses was meeting with God. Joshua was further down the slope. But both of them could hear the feast and the party, the commotion going on down below. Joshua thought he was hearing a battle taking place. And again, we're going to take this out of the God's Word translation in Exodus 32, starting at verse 17 and reading through verse 19. We read, Then Joshua heard the noise of the people shouting. He said to Moses, It's the sound of war in camp. Moses replied, It's not the sound of winners shouting. It's not the sound of losers crying. It's the sound of a wild celebration that I hear. And when he came near uh, the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing. And um, a burst in anger, Moses threw down the tablets and smashed them at the foot of the mountain. Hmm. We all know this story. It's a famous story. It's portrayed in most of the movies like Ten Commandments and stuff. Um, this golden calf is what's there. So where is the golden calf today? Can we find that if we start digging around there? Nope, you're not going to find it. Um, the golden calf is not around today because Moses, when he came down, he punished the people for breaking the laws. They just got done promising God they would follow his laws, not make graven Im images, not worship anything else but him. And just, just days later, this all happens. So Let's see what happens to the golden calf, first of all. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 21, it reads, this is the English standard now we're going back to, Then I took the sinful thing, the calf that you made, and burned it with fire and crushed it, grinding it into small, very small, until it was as fine as dust. And then I threw the dust of it into the brook that ran down from the mountain. So the calf's gone. You're not going to go there and find a calf today. No, calf you're not going to see. Moses ground it up and spread it into the stream and then forced the people who were sinning to drink out of that. And now that's interesting because it says that there's a stream nearby somewhere in this area. Well, there is a stream there. For one, water was flowing out of the rock for the people um, and it makes a stream. And there is a stream. Even to this day, there's the remains of a stream. Not very much. It's a dry place, but you can find where the remains of a stream were uh, coming down the mountain right down to the bottom of the mountain. You can see this. And in these pictures here, you can notice there's water and the rocks are very smooth and rounded by water erosion. This is the stream. So somewhere in here is where the gold dust went and the people were forced to drink this. But 
that's not all. There's something else, remember this. We have that altar. So the altar is there. The calf is gone, but we understand where the calf went. But there was a stream that's mentioned, an altar, and then there's a stream. Both of these fit this area, and that's what we're talking about. There's one more key to this area. Actually, this one is really interesting. A different Bible story takes place here at this mountain. And as we sort of conclude this whole series on this, I'm going to wrap it up with this. And this is a shocker to a lot of people. This is something that really, I mean, outside of the blackened mountaintops, which, I mean, that just blew me away. This is also amazing and is different than many of the other sites that claim people claim is Mount Sinai. About 600 years after all of this events take place with Moses, around the year 850 BC, we have the prophet Elijah having his showdown, as we've talked about before, with Queen Jezebel's prophets of Baal and Asherah. And where it took place was on Mount Carmel. And as you know, as the story goes, God answers Elijah's prayer. He burns up the altar um, and with fire coming down and everything. And then Elijah orders the people to kill all the false prophets. Jezebel was not there. Jezebel is very upset. And she puts out a contract, uh, basically, <laughs> to have Elijah killed. So Elijah runs for his life. Where does he run to? He runs to Mount Horeb, is what it says. He goes there. Why? To hide in a cave, it says. Hides in a cave. Then, hence, there has to be a cave big enough for somebody to hide in at this mountain site that we're talking about. If this is the true Mount Sinai, there will be a cave there. And guess what? There is a cave there. And as you can see, um, this cave is very large. Now, we read about this in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 8 and 9. And he arose and drank and went in strength uh, of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. And there he came to a cave and he lodged in it. So that's another event that we can see having to do to support this area is Mount Sinai. And this cave, as you can see from the pictures, is very large. In one picture, you can see there's some people. The picture was taken by the photographer standing in the back of the cave looking outward. And you can see this is a large cave. And there's even people in the cave. If you spot them, you can see some people laying down, one person in particular laying down on the side. This is a large cave. And this fits the whole story of dealing with that this is the place, Mount Sinai, of the Exodus account. So, though there's no stone uh, handwriting, Moses wrote down things, of course, but on scrolls, but he, he didn't write things on rocks. We don't have that. So we're never going to know with 100% certainty in this time period of, of, is this the actual Mount Sinai? Is this where all this took place as we've gone through this series now, this four-part series? We're not 100, I mean, to be 100%, you'd have to have like really solid archaeological evidence that is ref irrefutable. I have shown this presentation to many people. I see people come up and they say, I just can't believe this. I still think it's got to be Mount Sinai. And, or they say it's, it's this mountain over here, this mountain. It's interesting because the Muslims um, who live in the area there, what was ancient Midian, have said for centuries that we Christians have the wrong places. This is where it all took place. And there's the cave of Moses, is what they call that cave. And they have, have always thought that this is the right place. So as we started out, we talked about that I, I think there's an error in our Bibles, and I think it's in the atlas. We have a serious error in the atlas because we don't follow the biblical description and don't try and match the evidence that we see with what we're reading in the Bible. But when you do this, I think it's very compelling that this is the spot. This is how the Exodus took place. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining me on this journey that we have here of the Exodus. It's been a delight to do this for you. I hope you've um, this has strengthened your faith, has given you maybe some ammunition to, to study and, and to go out and, and talk to others about uh, the accuracy of the Bible, and these stories are really true. I hope this has helped you. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and... Uh, there's other series that we'll be doing, but we just concluded now the series on the Exodus account. Thanks for joining me, and until we meet again, take care and may God bless.
Support the show. Become a donor at evidenceforfaith.org give. 